Welcome to MicroCollege, a podcast exploring innovative, place-based, and humanly scaled responses to the crises in higher education, meaning, and discourse in our time. Everyone knows that colleges and universities are at a breaking point, but what can be done? I'm Jacob Hunt, the director of Thoreau College, a micro-college in Viroqua, Wisconsin. Join us each week as we tackle this question head on. Welcome to MicroCollege. Um, this week on the podcast, we are very excited to have David W. Orr as our guest. David Orr's writing has been an inspiration to me and to the Throw College project. Um, and so it's really, it's, it's, it's a treat to be able to talk to someone who's, who's had a direct impact on our thinking. David W. Orr has had a long and distinguished career in academia and beyond. He is the Paul Sears Distinguished Professor of Environmental Studies and Politics Emeritus at Oberlin College in Oberlin, Ohio. He's the author of many articles and books, especially on the topics of the environment, education, and culture, including ecolog ecological literacy, education, and the transformation to a postmodern world, and Earth in Mind on education, environment, and the human prospect. He is the founding editor of the journal Solutions and founder of the Oberlin Project, a, collaborated, a collaborative effort of the city of Oberlin, Oberlin College, and private institutions institutional partners to improve the resilience, prosperity, and sustainability of Oberlin. Before all that, back in 1979, David founded the Meadow Creek Project along with his brother Wilson. Meadow Creek was we might, what we might call a microcollege experiment in the Ozark Mountains of Arkansas. He's also taught at Schumacher College in England. And, and uh, yeah, so thank you very much for joining us today, David. Hey, Jacob. Thanks, thanks for having me. So here on, on MicroCollege, uh, we like to root what we do in people's stories and in their biographies. So if I could ask you to, to share a little bit with us about where you were around age 20. Where were you? What were you doing? What was, what was, what was memorable and stands out from that period of your life? Well, uh, let me see. At age 20, <laughs> I was a That seems like a million years ago. And... Uh, made a decision to go off and continue my education and go to grad school about that time. So I don't know what was memorable, but I do remember in particular courses that I was taking that uh, in history and in particular in literature that were really powerful motivators for me. And so I, I don't think it was any terribly memorable, but I, I do recall being excited about learning and um, what that entailed became a I've been a lifelong reader since a little kid so that that simply accelerated those those, tre those trends yeah. so what wh where did you grow up what was what was uh, what were you doing before you headed off to college well I grew up in a, a little town in western Pennsylvania New Wilmington Pennsylvania uh, my dad was the president of the college there Westminster College and uh, he was there for 17 years. So I grew up uh, from age five till I was in my early 20s uh, in that town. Uh, went off to graduate school for a year at Michigan State and then on to um, uh, University of Pennsylvania where I did my PhD work. Yeah. So, so you, it was a fairly you... uneventful childhood, but I do remember being, uh, it was very much a, uh, Aldo Leopold kind of farm country, uh -huh. you know, rolling hills and Amish farms nearby. A town, the town was, oh, maybe 2,200, 2,400 people had a college. Uh, but if I walked down Main Street in that town, uh, there were a couple of restaurants. There was an active movie theater. There were two hardware stores, a jewelry repair shop, a shoe repair shop, magazine store, pharmacy, two grocery stores, uh, a couple of car dealerships, a construction uh, supply house, uh, and a general store that had uh, dry goods, clothes, shoes, and so forth. And it also had once a week uh, service by train to Newcastle and then on to Pittsburgh. Now that was before the interstates, and so my recollections of uh, childhood were of a very complete little town. It wasn't Nirvana, but it was an awfully nice little town. It had virtually all the services you could you could ever expect. Uh, my mother didn't have to go out of town to buy anything. Um, 
um, milk was delivered in glass bottles mm -hmm. daily by a local dairy. And a good bit of what we've wrestled with since has been the destruction of those kind of places. Mm -hmm. And so a good bit of what uh, all of us are called to do is understand what happened and how do we recover some of the decency, resilience, and sustainability of that kind of world. Again, it wasn't nirvana, um, but it was an awfully good place to grow up. The uh, I don't want to dwell on this, but that was imprinted on me early on, that small towns didn't have to be simply bedroom communities. They, they could be decent, uh, civilized kind of places. But that was rolling hills, farm country, the mills, uh, the industrial part of the area was located 17 miles away in Youngstown, Ohio, or down in Newcastle and some of the surrounding cities that have now been pretty much de-industrialized, disinvested in. And so we, we, we have not yet begun to reckon with the cost of what that did, both to environment and to our uh, sense of conviviality and our politics and even to our souls. But that's, um, that, that's where I grew up. And I, so I saw the world in transition. I didn't know it then, but it, it was in marked transition from uh, that relatively self-contained small town world into something radically different. The interstate highway, as I was leaving town to go to graduate school, uh, interstate highway 80 was just cutting north of town. And I think that helped to accelerate the changes that were underway. I'll stop there. No, that, that, that's 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 a wonderful thread to follow. I think it's um, your your writing has has got this beautiful um, understanding of the role of place in education, and of just humanity. Um, and I think that's one of the inspirations we draw from Henry David Thoreau. Right, and in many ways, Thoreau was was already observing those changes with the railroad coming into Concord, Massachusetts, and yeah. and the changes that he was already seeing then back in the 1840s. Um, but and certainly here in in Driftless Wisconsin, southwestern Wisconsin, you know, we we are in a place that uh, you know has seen our, in my lifetime. You know, I'm in my 40s. I've seen major transitions in in the agriculture and in just yeah the economic and, and ecological structure of, of of life here. That is yeah generally not for the good in most ways. Um, certainly, the rest of the Midwest is is in many places depopulated um, and uh, and people are disconnected from from the land in radical ways. Mm -hmm. um, so how, how do you think that context has influenced your, your thinking and your, and your work as a, as a writer and as a, as a scholar and as a teacher? Well, I think it gave me a sense of possibility of what could be. Uh, Kenneth Bowling once said, that whatever is, is possible. And I saw that world uh, as a possibility. And not to not to return to because you can't go back but to inform how we go forward and what scale and with what quality and with what set of values and and skills that was a world where uh, people mostly knew how to make things the, the guys in the town at the coaching level and teaching level <clears throat> most of them were, were men were mostly World War II vets and so they knew something about service and something about applied patriotism, not flag waving, but applied patriotism. And I think that that sense of rootedness uh, affected me uh, to this day. I, I've seen a different world at work. Yeah. And I think the it also caused me, when I went to graduate school, uh, I did my economics part of my graduate training at Wharton Business School. And I found it fascinating, but I was I was wondering, I think my whole life, what what would cause us to destroy something or to be so careless with something that was uh, so well done? Uh, not because they planned it, but just because it occurred uh, uh, well. And it got me thinking about economics, and so I've been pondering economics almost uh, all my life. And there's an essay I had in a more recent book called Dangerous Years, um, Yale University Press 2017, I think it was, on economics. And it was very much informed by, by my experience as a kid growing up. And the... Uh, 
the intersection of work, environment, economy, conviviality, and scale. So I, I would say it was pretty formative. Uh, and, and I think I've been pondering my child, my childhood years. <laughs> uh, for the uh, now that I'm in old age, I've been pondering all that for a long time. But it, it's a fertile conversation, and it, there's so many people that have written about uh, both in memoirs of their lives growing up in small town America. Some were not not so good. I mean, small town America could be awfully benighted and misogynist and so forth. Um, but when it was good, it was it was very good. Never perfect, but very good. But then this is planet Earth, and nothing's ever perfect. <laughs> but, but it also it also created a, I think, a literature. Uh, Herman Daly's writing with uh, theologian John Cobb for the Common Good, a book that actually we helped to foster later in my life from a place that we started. Um, but there's a there's a considerable economic literature. And it all, one, one way or another, has to do with full cost and the fact that the industrial world wasn't built on paying full cost. The, the prices never told the truth about what we were doing to the world. Climate change is a result of that. Had we been charged for our carbon emissions, we would not have put near as much carbon in the atmosphere. And the same applies to pollution and sprawl and so forth. We, we simply subsidized our own ruination. Yeah. But there's quite a literature about that. And it goes back to Thoreau's time. Uh, and uh, so there's not, nothing new there, but it caused me to get into that, that mindset. Yeah. yeah, I think when you, to, to pick up one of your books, one of your essays, um, you can see that your 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 thinking is, is alive with the state of crisis of our moment, the the climate crisis, other you know the the the, re, the extinctions, all of the all of the real um, dramatic things going on in our environment, um, and and also you know consistently you're you're connecting this with with the form and the content of our education. Um, and, and so, yeah, one of the things you say is, for example, you know, for many of the reasons, the university, as presently conceived, is, as, is an unlikely source of remedy. It is committed not to transformation, great or otherwise, but more often than not to patching up flaws in the modern paradigm. Right? The, the university has, and higher education has played a key role in, in where we are today. Right? Um, in what ways has higher education contributed to, to, to the situation that we're in? Uh, Jacob, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> well, th th let me say that I've been in and around higher education as a uh, child in the home of a father employed by a college, a student in or teacher in virtually all my life. And I'm presently a professor of practice at Arizona State University, so I've been in and around higher education. I think I've seen what it can do, and I, I've seen – a good bit of what happens when ignorance is allowed to run loose. So I'm not, uh, I, I might, might be called a loving critic of education. I think we have to, it, first, first of all, it's a mysterious process. We really don't understand how Abraham Lincoln self-taught, mostly by reading in candlelight as a child, and so it could become what I think is the certainly one of the two or three greatest writers in American history, uh, his capacity for words. And we, we quote him uh, to distill the essence of the Civil War conflict down to 240 or whatever it was, words at Gettysburg. That was a man who had mastered uh, language in service of uh, nobility. And so education is a mysterious process. And on the other hand, uh, we know many highly educated people that are simply fools. So I, I think you have to start by saying that uh, wisdom, good judgment, capacity are randomly distributed up and down the socioeconomic education ladder. Uh, you can find as many people who work with their hands uh, with very little formal education that are very wise and understand things uh, better than people with you know, two or three PhDs. The other thing I would say is this. I think that the way the curriculum was formed, you have to admit that it's not uneducated people that are destroying the earth or causing climate change, climatic change or species extinction. It's 
highly educated people with MBAs and BAs, BSs, PhDs, and so forth. It, it's educated people that are doing the damage. And then I hasten to add, is that's not an argument against education, but education of a certain kind. And so then you have to ask, what kind of education is that? And I think it was a kind that early on became in service to a project. Uh, some people label this the modern project, but it was the mastery of nature. And you don't have to get very far into the writings of Francis Bacon or Descartes to understand what this is all about. This is human mastery of the planet, uh, down to its uh, uh, smallest elements. And so at the very start, the DNA of the contemporary model of education goes back to people like Bacon and Descartes and so forth, all the way through Henry Ford and industrialists and so forth. And that was all about mastery of nature if you had compared that at that time to what, let's say, tribal people in North America thought was important, it would have been a radical uh, disjunction. Not that either was totally right or totally wrong, but that we, we prioritize mastery over the natural world. And of course, uh, C.S. Lewis wrote, uh, wrote an essay once called The Evolution of Man, and in, in that essay he says something to the effect that the control of nature simply means, when you boil it down, the control of other men by the controlling of nature. Mm -hmm. And there's a profound truth in that. But that meant that the curriculum was structured around the capacity to control nature and domination of nature. And that runs through our sciences. And to some degree, that that's, that, that's unarguably good. I think uh, I can say for sure I'm alive because of modern science, the mastery of the nature of uh, epidemiology and virology and so forth. Uh, that saved my life on at least two occasions. Yeah. But there's yeah. also the bomb hangs hanging over our heads, and there is a mastery of computer science, which again is a mastery of nature that showed up as Facebook. And uh, did all kind of political mischief in the past uh, five or ten years, and so that that puts us in a bind of how to use education better, to better harness our intellectual capacities, not necessarily in the domination of nature, but to create a create a world that is convivial, sustainable, durable, just, fair. Uh, and we're still at that process, but I I, I say that that's you know, it's the game is late, but we're still in it. We're still alive. I think we still have the capacity to create uh, that much better world. Again, it's planet Earth, so it's not going to be perfect. This is not Nirvana. I've gone off on a long tangent, but I, I, I think that education is always in need of self-correction. So, if you ask of a typical college catalog, uh, what in this is important? and what's not important or trivial, and what in this catalog is downright dangerous. And I don't think there's anything you, you could, probably nothing you could, you could teach that would be irrelevant to the human condition, but you can teach anything in a way that is irrelevant. You can make Shakespeare boring and dull and pedantic, uh, but I think that there's, it's, it's how it's taught. But the most valuable people in, in the world, the people who shape young minds. I mean, that's why teaching is, uh, you know, I'm uh, very distressed by the fact that teachers are underpaid and understressed and uh, that the, even the fact of teaching, enlivening or educing, drawing forth young minds is so disparaged. Jacob, I think if I can put one advertisement in for you, I think the size and scale of uh, your institution is the right size and scale and offers the right kind of experience, experiential learning that connects head, hand, hearts. But I, I'll stop there. I, I think <laughs> it is a much tougher thing than simply mastery of facts and methods. Micro College is recorded in the broadcast studios of WDRT Viroqua, 91.9 FM, Driftless Community Radio on Main Street in Viroqua, Wisconsin. Thanks to Jim and all the folks at WDRT for the support of Thoreau College and the Micro College Podcast.
<laughs> well, th th thank you for that 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 um, that plug, and that certainly would like to get. We'll get to that, right? Because also through your own stories. Um, I just b before we leave the this this topic, you know, or maybe we won't leave it at all. But like this this sense of you know what you're offered is just is a great, a very wide ranging critique of the of really the structuring of knowledge in the modern world. If you go back to mm -hmm. Descartes and to and to Bacon, um, if we were to start out identifying maybe some of the problems that we're experiencing now begin there, right? That That's a big project, right? That, so how do, you, how do you structure knowledge? How do you structure education um, with that in mind? Um, is, is, yeah, it's is the core of what, what, what we're engaged with here and I, what I see you engage with as well. Um, yeah, so maybe so to, to talk about, um, about the scale question you mentioned, maybe could you tell us a, a little bit of the history of, of Meadow Creek? Sure. I... Uh, my brother and I had begun to. Your brother is a mechanical genius. Uh, he's kind of the Michael uh, Jordan of motion, mass, and energy. I've never seen anybody. <laughs> that could, I mean, he, he could diagnose an engine problem by just listening to it. And I'm not joking. And he, he could operate a backhoe. He could pick your teeth with a backhoe. I mean, he was just a, a genius with machinery. <laughs> anyway, he and I had been talking for a number of um, years about such things at family reunions and um, I was teaching at the time at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill and we decided to buy some land somewhere and create an educational center and begin to turn the philosophy of people like uh, Maria Montessori and John Dewey and so forth in, into reality and I was trained as a political scientist so I did nothing about these these kinds of things um, Fortunately, we, we did have a background. We both worked on farms and had a pretty good capacity of using tools and so forth. No strangers to hard work. So uh, long story short, we bought 1,500 acres in um, Stone County, Arkansas, uh, roughly a three-mile-long valley by about a mile wide. And the idea was to draw a circle around that and say if it happened in within that circle, it's curriculum. And so the way we farmed, we managed uh, 1,200 acres of forest out of that 1,500-acre land reserve. Uh, the way we built, the way we heated, the way we cooled things, that, that was all curriculum. And so we operated a, a, a small farm, uh, sometimes with 75 uh, cattle, did that all organically. We had a small uh, tillage operation of a couple hundred acres. Uh, we uh, had our own construction company. We built a sawmill. Uh, to saw timbers for the construction. We built a 25,000 square foot conference facility. And the idea was to, again, to use the place as its own curriculum. And I think we stumbled into a lot of things. When I began to read John Dewey, I found out that he had written early on in his, his various writings, including Education and Democracy, basically the same thing. The school ground being the curriculum for, for young people. And the idea was to begin to break down the separation of head, hand, heart. And it isn't just the, the head, it's also beginning to connect and unify the way the brain works. The, the two halves do very, apparently, people who study this say do very different things. One half is more male and domineering, one half is more uh, creative and perhaps subservient and so forth. But to begin to develop a unified response, and one of the keys is to have labor built into it or experiential uh, work built into that. And so uh, we, we educate for smartness, I think, by and large, going back to my critique of education, not for conviviality, not for compassion, not for empathy. If those things happen, they don't really happen often within a curriculum. So we, we're educating a certain part of the brain and leaving out the effect of hand learning, actually making things. And I think that that, in my own experience, that was important to actually do things with your hands mm -hmm. and begin to unify the, the human spirit and the human body around a certain set of activities. And there's a certain clock speed to that. It doesn't happen fast. The university, it's, you know, 120 credit hours, four years, you're out, you're gone. I mean, it's a, it's a industrial machine in that way. So, um, at Meadow Creek, we put together what I think was a, for its time, and I was only there 11 years, and then, it, to be honest, it began to fall apart after we left, and a lot of things, that's another whole other story. But for those 11 years, as we built it in this relatively pristine valley, 
and uh, including sawmill, farm operations, construction activities, and they had a staff of 24, and um, uh, labor that included a lot of local people. We helped to start the North Arkansas Blueberry Cooperative. We cut timbers for Amory Levin's uh, Rocky Mountain Institute, our sawmill. Uh, we did a number of conferences, including one with Bill Clinton, who was governor of Arkansas at the time, on climate change and banking. And that was 1988 or 89, so mm -hmm. way back. And we were just ahead of our time on, on issues of global warming and so forth. <laughs> did the first conference, uh, I think, ever held for New York Foundations and Sustainability. And a lot of that was built into the, you mentioned ecological literacy, the book, a lot of that was built into ecological literacy and also the later uh, book, Earth and Mind. But what that did for me was leaving Chapel Hill, which regarded itself a wonderful place and great university and so forth, but that was sort of the center, the Harvards and Chapel Hills and Stanfords and places like that, are really the center. And what uh, going to rural Arkansas, we, we located our place in the fifth poorest county in the 49th wealthiest state in the Union. It was poor. It was a, it's part of our third world. It still is by contemporary standards. Not as bad as, let's say, Lowndes County, Alabama, but it, it was poor. But going to the periphery, Jacob, when you look in from the periphery toward the center, there is so much that happens in the center you can realize by just changing the perspective. It's really unimportant or dangerous or trivial. And so uh, I don't think I saw the university in higher education for what it uh, for what it was until I went outside it and looked back at it. And um, again, it's not all bad. This is a, this is a lover's quarrel. Uh, a lot that happens in universities and colleges is wonderful. It's one of the real accomplishments of American life. And uh, Marilyn Robinson's writing about uh, uh, her university in Iowa is, is some of the best writing. It explains why this is really important stuff, teaching people to think and to write and to do and so forth. But uh, it also needs to be rethought as the human role in the ecosphere or the biosphere is rethought. We now have to realize we've, we've got to trim our sails and rethink who we are, what we are, and our place, our proper place in this thing we call nature. But Metacritic, uh, I think we were, we and staff, founders were the first students of the thing. We, we learned more than anybody ever did. That and really I resonates, to, David. <laughs> well, I, I mean, you know, all of a sudden you've got to figure out your chief bottle washer, dishwasher, mechanic, repairman, you know, and, and we had in our conference center, we had uh, uh, eight compost toilets. And I decided since I, I, I was one of the founders, I had to do one of the least, <laughs> most disagreeable jobs. So I uh, volunteered to, you know, maintain and clean out and empty the, oh. the uh, eight composting toilets. And we would have a couple thousand people a year through the place. So the, the, the job is not a small job. But I don't want to brag, but I, I became very good at cleaning out composting toilets. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I actually came to kind of enjoy it. I mean, it's part of the waste cycle. And it was, uh, uh, of course, all that went back on as fertility to various gardens and our tree cropping efforts and all that. But I saw the world very differently. And I think that a good bit of, uh, I sent you the essay on education and transition. And I, I think I ended that by talking about Thoreau College, Schumacher College, uh, Deep Springs College scale efforts that whittle down complicated subjects to their essence, whether it's arguing with your cows that want to get out of the pasture or recalcitrant weeds and Johnson grass or, you know, what, whatever you have to do. But you whittle down uh, and, and you give the mind time to catch up and mull things over. Mary Midgley, the great uh, British philosopher, died a few years back, but one of my favorite philosophers, and she she kind of reminded me of your grandmother standing in the kitchen with a apron on and waving a wooden spoon at you and saying, now, David, you can do better than this. <laughs> she was kind of saying, you can think more clearly than this, and you can connect more uh, uh, coherently and cogently than you're, you're doing. But um, 
I think that the the experience that that Medicare did had for me was largely, and the same with my little town in New Wilmington, the scale was right to get your head around it. So when we did the uh, Adam Joseph Lewis Center here at Oberlin College, where, where I still live in Oberlin, although I'm a professor of practice in Arizona, the <clears throat> that is the first entirely solar powered, zero discharge, platinum not platinum rating, they didn't have the rating system in place at the time we did it, but platinum scaled building on a U.S. college campus. And I had 250 students work variously on aspects of that project, and it became, it, it is still there, entirely solar powered, still zero discharge. But you can get your head around a 14,000 square foot building and climb it in a way that you can't if you start with a globe and say, oh, the world is heating up, and oh my God, and we're 420 parts per million and we're all doomed and so forth. A specific building in a specific place that you're familiar with. Very important. It, and students worked on it. It's still a laboratory for student engagement and all kinds of things, whether it's gardening or managing the living machine or uh, collecting data or whatever. So we use the building as curriculum. Uh, later, when I wrote an essay called Architecture's Pedagogy, it was the point was that buildings have a pedagogy, uh, mostly unspoken. But where do the materials come from? How does it work? Uh, how is it heated? How is it cooled? Uh, what's the effect of certain spaces on the human mind and perception? And but the scale had to be right to for at least uh, given my dim-witted mind, it, a scale had to be at a point where I could mull it over. Mary Midgley started to say has this wonderful essay uh, called "Why Smartness Is Not Enough." And in that essay, she describes her best students as sometimes being C students. The, the A-plus students, you know, could cram the night before an AC exam and get an A in a course. Her C students sometimes had a different quality. They were slow thinkers, but they thought thoroughly. And they, they could mull something over, complicated moral issues. And, and Lordy knows we're, we're in a world of complicated moral issues. Mm -hmm that they could mull things over and come up with the right answer. But it was the scale and the velocity was time to our nature as humans. And uh, we're, somebody once pointed out a long time ago, we're tribal creatures. You know, we, we grew up sitting around campfires telling stories for the first, what, uh, we've been around 100,000 years. That was the first 98,000 of it or some such. But uh, anyway, I'm off on a tangent, so you're getting, getting Well, yeah, I, I think what you're, you're pointing to, one of the things I wanted to ask you uh, um, about was uh, you, you talked about at Meadow Creek, you know, thinking about, you know, head, heart, and hands, right? That those that kind of three-pillared understanding of human nature and of education and of just practice in the world is something that's at the heart of the Waldorf schools, which is one of our influences. It's also really at the heart of Deep Springs College, which talks about academics labor and community or self-governance, right? Um, I guess I'm wondering about how at Meta Creek or, or in, in situations that you've seen to really work, how is that heart component, um, a word you like to use a lot is, is conviviality, right? Maybe could you give a sense of that word and what that means and, and what does that look like in a, in, a, in a humanly scaled small institution? That's a really good question and for which I don't have a good answer, but not having a good answer has never stopped me to pass. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you, you know, most of, I think what, what we call heart activities is not uh, necessary philanthropy or that kind of thing, giving stuff away. I think it probably begins with engagement with people in conversations. And I'm not sure that they happen typically in learned conversations as easily as they do in the natural conversations of occurring between people who are working together doing something. Some of the best conversations I ever had were with uh, other folks while we're getting in hay on 90 degree days mm -hmm. uh, or fixing a particularly perplexing carburetor on a recalcitrant uh, Ford pickup truck. Um, it was in a common labor of that you realize 
your common humanity. And I remember working as a uh, construction labor way back a million years ago when I was a kid just coming out of college for a summer. I did that regularly, so I was familiar with construction work, but the um, uh, race was on people's minds. That was at the height of the Martin Luther King years. And uh, working with African Americans who I, we, we didn't have any in our town. Our town was totally white. But working with African Americans and playing sports with them, you, you talked and friendships can occur there but I think the heart begins with conversations if you can't say it you can't probably can't feel it as much I don't want to be absolute here because I think the heart can be influenced in all kinds of ways mm -hmm. um, but I think it starts in very mundane experiences and I think it, it, it starts in the capacity to converse not to lecture or talk at but to engage and I think that most easily occurs when you're under common stress of a job to be done. And so workers, uh, unionized workers typically in, in the old steel towns around where I grew up, had pretty long relationships, not always perfect, but with their neighbors. They worked together. They got their lunchbox together and walked to the factory together. Um, I think the same is true in virtually anything. It's common endeavor and the capacity to talk through issues, and, and not big issues. I mean, you start with trivial things, but those trivial things are loaded with the prejudice and the sins of the time also. The Driftless Folk School, located in the beautiful rolling hills and valleys of southwest Wisconsin, is a community of lifelong learners dedicated to cultivating personal and cultural resilience through hands-on educational experiences. The Driftless Folk School offers classes in agriculture, land stewardship, natural history, folk arts and crafts, herbalism, wilderness skills, and more. For further information on the Driftless Folk School, visit us at driftlessfolkschool.org on the World Wide Web. And if you think about the, the ecological and environmental issues that you, you're, you write about, um, how many of those are at base really connected with our trivial activities, right? Our, Consumption, our driving of cars, with where food comes from, like things that are not our, our, our main activity, but our choices that are made unconsciously or, or in context that are, that you could say are informal or, or in between mm -hmm. the main courses of things. I think that at, at a compass, mm -hmm. like at Deep Springs uh, College, for example, like those kind of things become part of the content of the conversation, right? Do, does it, do we, do we, you know, drive down to the other end of the valley? Do we buy this thing? Do we, you know, what mm -hmm. those decisions become, become ethical choices, but also subjects of conversation around a dinner table and that, that there's a certain scale of community where that can happen and others where it can't. Yeah. Jay Glenn Gray, who, was early on one of my one of the key people I read. He was a World War II vet. He wrote written a book on World War II, and I forgot the title of it. But he wrote a book which I've got on my shelf over here somewhere. I've kept it all these years from I think it was Wesleyan Press but on education. And he uses the word implicatedness. And one of the marks of an educated person is to understand their implicatedness in the world. And if, if you if you type that word in. Uh, your spell checker will immediately yeah. underline it in red. Yeah. Love those words. <laughs> words Micro college is one of those words at the moment, so that's keep it that way. Yeah. I, <laughs> I used it anyway, just part of the it's part of me. But the implicatedness of the world and you find that none of us are innocent in this whole thing. And what has happened in this world as as we went from that localized world I described, and even before that, back to the Thoreau's own time where you knew where things came from. You knew something about the producer, manufacturer, or the grower of certain things. You knew the craft work that went into certain things. You, you could identify the tree where things came from. Uh, there is a marvelous book. I'm going to do a professorial thing here. There was a marvelous book um, called the... Uh, Wheel craft. I'm going to walk across my library here, see if I can see this real quickly. I'm blanking on the title of the author because I go off on Jay Glenn Gray. But um, it is the Wheelwright Shop. Yeah. And it is 
by George Sturt. Uh, that's a pen name. And that uh, book is still in print. Cambridge University Press, or one of those, keeps it alive. He was a wheelwright in England. He was one of the last. He describes making a wagon for one of his neighbors. And he made a different wagon if his ground was rocky and hard as opposed to marshy, wet, and so forth. The wheel width was different. And you'd structure it differently. And you would go to that tree over there in, in that hollow a mile away to get that particular tree material, wood material, to make that particular wagon. That was a person who had to understand both the making of a wagon, um, why do the spokes uh, not line up with the wheel? What's the reason behind that? And there was this old ancient craft, and he says someplace in that book that he never knew the price of a thing, but he always trusted his customers not to cheat him. <laughs> get your Ford 250, you know, and you're you're buying something from Ford Motor Company. But that 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 isn't just charming. There was a lesson in that of trust and that local interstitching of local knowledge, craft knowledge, and uh, a trusting social structure. And there, there was a great deal in that that was their implicatedness was joint in our case we all know you, you, you go to the store you buy something you have no idea where it came from what was the cost what were the what were the collateral damages done by making this manufacturing it, shipping it and so forth uh, there's an interesting uh, friend of mine in, in uh, London right now sent me a playbook called The Trials. It's by Don King. It's being performed in London right now. I don't know the theater. It's just a short book to play. But, but what happens in this book called The Trial, and who's on trial was us, our generation. And the accusers are subsequent generations, but they know enough about us to know our behavior, so it's not far distant future. And they have three characters on trial in particular, and have these trials going in the jury. And they're nice people. They've done well. They're members of Sierra Club, and they had uh, bought green things. They tried to introduce green to their corporations and so forth. But every one of the three is condemned to death because of their carbon emissions. Hmm. And they're, they're, don't don't ask all the details about how they knew these things because it's never explained in the play script. But um, we live in a world where we don't really know the cost. And so the carbon emissions uh, are right now the most, it's probably the best summary of our various ecological sin, ecological and human sins. Um, and Jacob, I've gotten off track. I don't remember what your question was. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> but, but I've been rambling on for a while. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess, um, uh, I guess maybe to, to bring it back to, to course, I, I think, um, the one of the reasons that that your work is 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 influential for us is you you know you write in, in ecological literacy about Thoreau and about Walden, um, and and really Thoreau Henry David Thoreau's um, experiment of living at Walden as an example of a pedagogy of a of a, of a curriculum mm -hmm. you could say and it's a curriculum that is has a lot of you could say ecology and a lot of science. Of course, he's he's measuring the depth of the pond. He is observing the migrations of the birds. He is observing the changes of the season. But it's also uh, the humanities. It's also philosophical and uh, and uh, and and the life of the mind is, is a key part of that as well. Um, and so I'm wondering about you know in 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 an, in an education that really is so explicitly connected with with ecology with the environment. Lots of you could say STEM topics as they talk about it today. Um, I guess, uh, how how do how do we work on 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 ourselves? How do how how are students become wise uh, in in a curriculum of the kind that you're talking about? And what is the role of the humanities in that? Well, um, you you don't have a course wisdom one hundred and one. So if, if, and to the extent a student or a person ever becomes wise, it's the culmination of lots of different things. And I think the capacity to connect different things across 
uh, those various lines that divide us is, is critical. I think what the humanities do is, um, I mentioned earlier in my undergraduate life, a particular professor got me to love Shakespeare mm. and the life of words and language. He was totally unpublished, a uh, brilliant teacher, uh, but he, he taught me that. And I think the point of humanities is to give the mind enough pegs to hang concepts on, uh, enough of those concepts based on literature, particular characters, the trials and travails of uh, humanity and, and all of our glory and all of our weakness and so forth. And you can find out a lifelong interest in literature and philosophy is, I think, critical. And what do we it's a great example. Many many people would say, like Shakespeare, you know, if we look, we're facing, you know, environmental crisis. We're having having you know pollution and extinctions. Why spend time reading Shakespeare? Right. I definitely have had students at the high school level and and, and other people say that to me. What's what's the rebuttal to that? Oh my goodness! What's not the rebuttal to it? Uh, <laughs> That is such a callow view of the mind. And when, when somebody faces those challenges of the day, uh, I don't care if it's Zelensky in Ukraine or, uh, you know, a judge facing Donald Trump in some issue, you draw from the your, your toolkit or your uh, the repertoire of ideas and concepts and philosophies and examples that you accumulate over a lifetime. And I don't think reading humanities is the only way to do these things, but I think it is a necessary thing. Uh, and it could be it, it could be small by volume, large by effect. Mm -hmm. in kind of the way that salt changes the flavor of the stew. Uh, but it, it's the kind of thing that, and also I think that Abraham Lincoln was quite a reader in the White House. He didn't read, I think, that widely, but he read a good bit of Shakespeare, and I believe that uh, I've read that Hamlet was his favorite Shakespeare play, and he read it over and over again. And I think one of the things humanities does is to give us some solace to understand we're not the first people to face challenges. Uh, we're not the first people to have to weigh incommensurables. We're not the first people to have to realize that sometimes you're dealing with two competing goods or to realize that there is no good alternative that you have in your choices, competing evils. And that human experience should not be discarded any more than an athlete would discard the experience of practicing day after day after day, and that's kind of built into your muscle memory and in our intellectual memory or soul memory. I think we need those examples that spring out of literature, out of philosophy, out of the human past. And in wrestling with democracy, which is what I do now in this climate and democracy initiative that we're running out of Arizona State, uh, my goodness, the, the case for democracy can't be airtight. We, we, it, it grew out of our experience in Athens, the Western version of it anyway. And democracy there was so flawed. It didn't last long. And virtually every headline in the paper, in our papers today, reflects something that uh, Thucydides complained about in his description of the Peloponnesian Wars. You know, greed, uh, shallowness, uh, violence, stupidity, uh, mob rule. I mean, it was all, it was all there. And so it is that combination of humanities and history, I think, that is kind of an anchor. And if nothing else, uh, it reminds us of our own fallibility, or it should remind us of our fallibility. We're, we're fallen critters, prone to make mistakes, and that's just the, what we are. That's the human condition. And we're never going to quite escape that. Uh, so I think we can do better than we do, but the fact that we can do better than we do I find myself going back to uh, Lincoln and, to, and, and to people like Thoreau, but I mean, there's a magnificent literature built up in American history in the 19th century. And Lincoln's uh, lines in that second inaugural address of uh, with malice toward non-charity for all. 
uh, I mean, my goodness. Uh, that ought to be read by every politician. You never win completely, and you are never completely right. Yeah, one of the great pieces of oratory, for sure, in, in, in history. Yeah. Um, I, I think a term, um, a concept that, that I see in your work um, that really resonates with me is the Greek concept of paideia, um, mm -hmm. which one of the places that, that, that you, you define it as the goal of education is not the mastery of the subject matter, but of one's person, right? Self-mastery. Um, can you expand on that? What, what, is, what, is the, what does paideia mean for you, and, and, and how, how does that influence the design of an education? Well, the, the, the classic treatment of paideia was uh, Ernst Jaeger's uh, three volumes on it, published a million years ago, a long time ago. It, it's the search for excellence. And for the Greeks from which the concept was derived, it is that belief that uh, the striving for excellence, not for profit, not for wealth, not for power, but for excellence. And to the extent that money or power were important, it was only in the search for uh, a more adequate lever to move the world toward excellence. So um, I think that we, we've gotten off track. We, we have, at the end of a uh, four-year career in college, we had career counseling. <laughs> I mean, it, we, it's bass backwards. Uh, <laughs> you, should have, you should have life counseling first. Get your life right. What do you want to be excellent in? What do you want uh, to do? And then, which career do you want to hitch to that goal? So the, the life questions come first, the career questions come second. Yeah. And I used to teach a design course um, ecological design course when I was actively teaching at Oberlin and we always designed something that was going to be built so they, they students worked on the Lewis Center and then later on the, the hotel we finished here a couple of years ago, well back in 2016 Italian Solar Power Platinum Hotel I had students work on the design aspect of that building but first thing in the class I would ask them what do you uh, draw your or write your epitaph. What do you want in your epitaph? And of course, at age 20 or 21, kids say, you know, what? No one told me I was going to die. <laughs> um, but what's your epitaph? We, we want said about you. And the last thing in the, in the course, they would uh, uh, rewrite their epitaph. But what do you want? You, you, you design things in the world. What do you want said about those things? And of course, it, it isn't ever perfect. And one of the, one of the aspects of Paideia, I think, is self forgiveness because we always fall short of it and the worst thing that can happen is we become kind of nags at, at our own self shaking our own finger in our face to say you you failed you fell short you goofed up uh you're dumb whatever but the idea is that self-resilience that keeps us moving toward something better than what we otherwise would do and better can be defined in lots of different ways but i think it's, it's defined as full-hearted, compassionate, empathetic, leading, courageous, brave, uh, and so forth. It's not defined the way most career planners seem to think it should be defined as accumulating a whole lot of money. Amen. Yeah, so I think that, that you know, the, 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 you're, you're articulating a set of virtues, a set of values, a set of, of, uh, sort of principles of character that are... Um, they are, yeah, they're formed in practice, right? And, and I think in, in the life of a small community where people are in dialogue, are interacting mm -hmm. and having to, to navigate their, their weaknesses and their, and their interests, um, that's certainly one of the things that, that appeals to me uh, that I believe in about, about the scale of, of school that we're talking about here. Um, yeah, so, so the, the, the essay that you mentioned um, earlier on that you've shared with me recently published um, is published as mm -hmm. New Agenda for Higher Education in the Great, Tra the Great Transition Initiative. We'll post that to the, to the notes for this podcast. Um, it, it does seem like a, like a great summary of many things you've talked about and other things that you've written earlier on. So it's, thank you for sharing that and for writing well, that. Well, you're welcome. And thank you so much for the time with you. I've, I've enjoyed the, the conversation. Thanks for the good work you're doing. I wish you well. I know it's not easy to start a uh, nonprofit educational organization. Yeah, you know but. that from personal experience. So <laughs> <laughs> it means a lot. <laughs> I do. But I would take nothing for that experience. In our case, it turned out for the time I was there to be, uh, it got easier every year that passed. Yeah. But it, it's a. Uh, I would take nothing for those years. Uh, we, we made it harder on ourselves than we probably should have. 
but I met so many good people and had such incredible experiences and learned so much that uh, um, I, I just take nothing for that experience. I really appreciate your bravery and courage and commitment to uh, do it as you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Thank you for spending some time with us today. And uh, yeah, have a good day. Hey, same. Jacob, thank you. Be well. All right. Okay. <laughs> Bye-bye.